Literary Legends and Luminaries. I'm Julie, and welcome to another episode of Booksmart. Today's book is a unique one, Molly by B Blake Butler. Blake and Molly are married. Molly commits suicide. This is Blake's story of what happened to Molly and all that he discovered after her suicide. I had mixed reactions to this book, although it was tremendously captivating until about three-fourths through the story. The story begins with the day of Molly's suicide. I don't feel I need to reveal the details for you. You can read those yourself. But Blake is the one who finds her body. She left a note, which Blake shares with the reader. Then Blake goes back to the beginning of their relationship. He fills in some of the details with Molly's journals. When I picked this book up, I thought it was going to be more like Go Ask Alice, where the journal is sort of the bulk of the story, but it's not. Blake is the one telling all of it, only adding in a few lines here and there for Molly's journals, mostly lists or summarizing its contents. He does add pictures throughout as well. Before I get into any details, I need to discuss Blake's memoir writing style. As you can see, there aren't any chapters. Blake doesn't even utilize paragraphs. At times, his narrative style gave the memoir a poetic feel, a continuous blend of ideas and descriptions and reflections. However, 312 pages of it is a bit much. Some of the material is heavy, burdensome almost. It's certainly not lighthearted and there is no comic relief anywhere. The segment breaks are really all enough at times. I think paragraph structure for some of the longer pieces might have helped digest it as a reader, especially with all the typos and word misplacements and missing words. That started to aggravate me beyond belief. Blake didn't self-publish the book. Archway Editions did. There's four different editors listed on the copyright page. They all did a poor job. The misplaced words and missing words pulled me out of the story, especially combined with Blake's lengthy sentence structure, some of which went on for many lines. I had to stop and start several times to figure out what the sentence should have read. Completely unacceptable in my opinion, but nowadays such errors have become commonplace. I guess their standards have dropped in terms of grammar and nobody cares. Let me read you a short excerpt from the beginning so that you can get a feel for Blake's writing style. The song will still there with me in my head as I arrived back at our driveway. Looking up from halfway along the path toward our front porch stairs, I saw a shape covering the door's spy hole, a plain white envelope affixed with tape. My body seized. From early in our relationship, I had visions of Molly picking up and leaving just like that, deciding on a whim and without warning she preferred to be alone. Running up the steps, already flooding with adrenaline, a pounding pulse, I saw my first name, Blake, handwritten in the center of the envelope space in Molly's script. Immediately, I wailed, devoid of language, too much, too fast, real and unreal. Inside the envelope, a two-page letter printed out. My mind froze on the first lines. Blake, I have decided to leave this world. Then there was nothing but those words, words to which I have no crawl, no connection, no distinct definition in that moment, even as simple as they seem. Every sentence I've tried to put here to frame, it feels like a doormat laid on blood, an unstoppable force colliding with an intolerable object in slow motion beyond the need of being named before and after. How powerful is that? Before and after. We've all lived through those moments that suddenly divide our lives into before and after. He captures that moment beautifully, for we as readers can feel it right along with him. For the story itself, well, I have mixed views of it. First off, I don't want to criticize Blake's or Molly's actions. I try to avoid doing that with any memoir, instead looking at how the story was told and written and how those plot points were developed. But it's almost impossible to separate the two with the way Blake tells the story. Blake and Molly are incredibly relatable at first. They are both deeply flawed individuals, which is how we all are. Blake writes so knowingly at the beginning of showing the reader these flaws. He doesn't sugarcoat his own culpability in the relationship, yet he doesn't paint Molly in this angelic light either. At times, I was rolling my eyes at Blake's neediness or temperamentalness. Other times, I was rolling my eyes at Molly's selfishness and ungratefulness. Sometimes, I was envious of both of them, seeming to have the perfect writer lifestyle, neither having to go to work and having chickens in their backyards <clears throat> and going for walks whenever they felt like it. Blake also wrote that sometimes they did nothing all day but smoke pot and dabble in other drugs, which then made me grimace as their downward spiral continued because I thought, hmm, many people would love to trade places with you and live that kind of lifestyle, maybe with or without the drugs, I don't know. 
yet neither of them were really happy. Then other times I was thankful I was not in their position. It's a book that has many ups and downs, much like real life. That's why it was simultaneously captivating, yet also overwhelming. I had to stop reading it at other times because it got to be too much, if that makes sense. Knowing that Molly commits suicide and some of the surface details surrounding it, I found myself both sad and judgmental while reading. I try not to be judgmental when I read memoirs, but suicide is one of those topics where I always try to find the reason not to, where the person could have made a thousand other decisions than take their own life. At times, Molly reminded me of Richard Corey, a poem I brought up several times in Booksmart. Richard Corey appears to have everything is envied by all yet he kills himself molly is a published writer <clears throat> she even appears on a tv cooking competition that then gets canceled because of sexual harassment claims regarding the host she has a fabulous college teaching job but then is overwrought with workplace stress she has plenty of time to write to bake to grow as an artist in so many ways it's frustrating to see her get so depressed about all her good fortunes she even travels to poland and visit holocaust sites for her second book and then comes home and tells Blake all that she should be grateful for, but it must not stick. We never know what lies beneath the surface of anyone, even those that are closest to us. As the story unfolds, Blake did have some red flags in their relationship. Molly doesn't tell him that she was married before until much later in their relationship. Their relationship has many stops and starts in the beginning as well. There's also an incident where she claims a man held her came to her apartment and held her at gunpoint, yet she never went to the police. Molly seemed to have a double life at times, but Blake didn't seem bothered by it. They still got married. After Molly commits suicide, Blake finds out even more that all was not what it seemed. Molly journals and leaves these journals behind. Yet she deleted some of her files and some of her pictures, but not all. In her journal, she even states that she's been tossing stuff and getting rid of things to make it easier on Blake when she's gone. Yet the stuff she doesn't get rid of, the stuff she had to have known Blake would find, is a bit disturbing. It's almost sociopathic, in my opinion, that she left such things behind for him to find. I don't know how much of the story to tell you, but close your ears if you don't want to hear any spoilers. Molly had multiple affairs and even partook in some sexual online activity that also took place in person. What's even worse is that Molly appeared to groom some of her students. That is Blake words, not mine, and had multiple affairs with these students until the student called it quits. Another affair went on for years, and when Blake talks to the other guy, learns that Molly told the other guy that she was going to leave Blake. Let me read you a part of Blake's memoir where he is grappling with learning all of this new information. She'd been through more than I could ever imagine, and I knew this. It made her seem so strong to me, so wise, her hard edge only a product of neglect and isolation, how much she'd always felt alone, no matter what. Now my mind raced with bone-shaking anxiety, already filling in all of the blanks ripped in my mind with furious elaborations of what she'd done. My brain filled thick with floors of snuffy nightmares made even worse under my imagination's incessant elaboration, enough to make me want to bash my head in right then and there to keep from being forced to learn the difference between my experience of our reality and what had been really going on right under my nose behind my back without any way now to go to Molly and demand to know the all of it and why to get to look really her in the eyes beyond the mask. Every memory I'd been hanging on to for dear life felt different now, rugged out from underneath me like a field of fire, zero sky, but all the smoke. Just imagine that. I mean, I really feel for him. It's difficult to imagine such a betrayal, yet he will never know why or what else happened or even gain any sense of closure from Molly. I have to admit, and I hate to admit it, that I don't like Molly all that much anymore. Her chaos appears to be self-created. Both Molly and Blake were in therapy, but even though it was Molly's idea, she quits while Blake keeps going. Of course, she hadn't. he hadn't known that she had quit. I don't know if Molly had an undiagnosed mental disorder or what. Blake thinks she may have had pers borderline personality disorder, but he doesn't develop much about it. I struggle more with what I feel Molly deliberately left behind for Blake to find. Blake doesn't appear to think that it's as diabolical as I do, or at least he never writes about that. Sometimes I wonder if Molly didn't consider the lives, and especially the deaths, of writers like Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton, that knowing how we look at their writing life and all of their stuff after the fact, published and unpublished, might have been some motivation as well for Molly to leave behind what she did. 
The last fourth of the book is a bit jumbled for me. Part of that is my fault. I was expecting it to unfold using the narrative structure of a, sh of a story with some climatic reveal or some epiphany by Blake. Neither really happens. I credit Blake for taking the high road. Wrote. He remembers Molly's happy moments and the times they were happy together. He's done an excellent job at capturing his pain and confusion, as well as coming to an acceptance of all that he's discovered. When I looked at some of the reviews, it appears as though some readers think he's trying to capitalize on Molly's suicide. I don't see it that way. She deliberately left all the evidence behind, even though she chose to get rid of and destroy other things. It's a compelling read nonetheless, although I would prepare readers that it is not a feel-good book and does not have much of a satisfying ending. I don't think Blake reveals all the details to his readers. There are still many questions. Even if Blake doesn't have those details, the way he writes about it is frustrating at times. As the story unfolded, I started to read it almost like a true crime book, trying to unravel the lies and such. Yet nothing is all that well developed despite Blake's poetic writing style. So ultimately, would I recommend this book? For its uniqueness, yes. I would say Molly is worth the read. If you're a writer or an avid reader, Blake does an excellent job at writing about something that is unfortunately more common than we'd like it to be and tells a captivating story in a unique way. However, read it with caution. You will not feel better about anything while you're reading it or after you're done reading it. It reminded me of The Road, both the book and the movie. It's so depressing and dreary, so much so that when you finish, it's difficult to find the shred of light in it. If you watched last week's episode of Book Smart about Anne Lamont's Bird by Bird, she said that writers should be part of the solution. Maybe Blake published the book for all of those who've lost loved ones to suicide, that despite such the pain the living is left with, you can move on. You can hold on to the happy times anyway, even if the person you loved was not all that he or she appeared to be, and also eventually be happy yourself. That we all have choices and we can choose to accept the past and the people in it move on and find happiness. Thanks for watching. As always, my goal at Booksmart is to get a little bit smarter, one book at a time.